what would be the main reason that I went, or the, the main factor that <laughs> in my going into mathematics, I would say the fact is that I had an older a sister who was older than myself by three years. And so when I was learning, uh, my class was learning arithmetic, was learning addition, she taught me multiplication. <laughs> they were learning multiplication, I learned algebra. And so I was always a little bit ahead of my, of my class, and so it's not surprising that, that I chose a subject that I was good at, at least uh, you know, one of the better students in, in the class. Um, uh, let me say a little bit about my high school career, since most of you, I understand, are are in that, are in that uh, uh, level now. Um, two, things, two, two things that stand out when I think of my high school career. One, one is, well, what was my favorite subject? My favorite subject was, I think, was geometry. Since it gave you, it allowed you to think, you could go in whatever direction you wanted to go, as, as long as you were doing the right, as long as you weren't, as long as you're doing things that are logical, you can solve a problem in any way you wanted to. There wasn't one way that you had to go about a problem, even though sometimes it would, it would seem that way the, way, the way the subject is taught. You must do this is, this is true by definition, this is true, et cetera, et cetera. The, um, you just think about it yourself and, um, and you can get there. And, um, uh, and I, in some sense, I can say that there's a, uh, recently realized that there was a particular geometry problem which in some sense was responsible for my career. And, um, and I say this because it turned out that a, fr a colleague of mine, uh, actually uh, John Aumann, who became a mathematical economist, it turned out to be the same problem, the same geometry problem that led him into, into a career in, in mathematics. So I'll tell you the problem since... Uh, um, uh, Every, everyone knows it, it's easy to see if you have an isosceles triangle, then everything on one side is the same as on the other side. In particular, if the angle bisectors, look at the angle bisectors of the base angles, they will also be equal because just by sort of the symmetry of the situation. But, but the problem is, suppose now that that's what you're given. The only thing you're given about the triangle is that the angle bisectors are, are equal. Prove that the triangle is isosceles. And uh, well, uh, a, f a friend of mine in high school, Sh Shlomo Sternberg, who later became a professor at Harvard, he and I heard about this problem, and uh, we decided well, we're going to attack it. And each, both of us, in our own way, solved the problem uh, after about two weeks of hard work. And it turned out that there was a uh, our high school was in the same building as as the college. It, this was Yeshiva College, and there was a professor. It was a, pr a, pr a professor who was an editor of a, of, a, of a mathematical journal who had an office in this in the college. Uh, we thought this is something very, this is an important, very important person, and so we decided we'll both go and show him this uh, what we've done, and uh, and he was very encouraging of, uh, uh, to us. Although, and we told him, well, uh, you know, it took us a long time to do this, and he said, other people have tried and they didn't succeed at all. So. If the problem takes a long time, don't shouldn't bother you. And uh, and he continued uh, contri giving me problems, and he was actually a, a, a close friend. Of, he was a friend of Erdish, and so he knew about a lot of problems, and he encouraged me in, in that direction of problem solving and uh, did other things which enabled me not to have to work for money, uh, I, that I would get money working for the magazine that he edited. At any rate, I think of this problem as a... <laughs> As, as a problem that, that, that helped me into my into a mathematical career. Another thing that, th that I think of when I think of my high school career in, in, in a different direction, the direction of, of algebra, is uh, of course at that time, and hasn't changed that much, I, was, I wanted to become famous, a famous mathematician, and I knew that one way I could become famous was to show that uh, imaginary numbers could not exist, that you would come to some contradiction in mathematics if you used, by using imaginary numbers. So I filled notebook after notebook of calculations on and on. Every once in a while I made a mistake and I thought I had solved it, and no, it was, wasn't one the solution. But um, of course, it, it was quite a while afterwards I realized why, why I was not able to, to do what I wanted to do. You can show, you can prove that it is, 
no contradiction in using real numbers, then there's not going to be a contradiction using imaginary numbers. By, uh, but, at, but at any rate, the, uh, I think I learned from this two things. One thing is that if, if you fail at working on a problem in mathematics, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be discouraged. And uh, uh, actually, uh, if, if a problem is worthwhile doing, then you'll probably fail at it m m a good part of the time. Um, but that's a mathematician. I, th I think someone, someone once pointed this out in a, in a radio program. A mathematician is someone who considers uh, failing only 90% of the time. Is, uh, that's successful. <laughs> and, uh, um, but it was also very good to just have this exercise in doing, doing all kinds of calculations and, um, and just, just getting used to calculating and uh, to... Uh, um, at any rate, um, one thing that's nice about geometry, going back to geometry, is, is that you, in some sense, you can see what you're doing. I mean, you can see you have an idea often, well, this is obvious that this should be so, but, but now prove it. And this also happens a lot in, 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 in mathematics in different forms that intuitively you feel that this is right or it should be right, and then the problem is go, go and prove it. And this turns out to be a good motivation for for much of mathematics is, is that you have this feeling that, that uh, such a theorem should be right. And uh, um, let me say a little bit about what I'm, uh, a little bit about my, my later work, uh, since, since working with isosceles triangles. Um, the, um, there's a movie called A Beautiful Mind. It's a movie about John Nash, also an Abel Prize laureate. Um, I shouldn't say also. <laughs> At any rate, the, uh, um, in this movie, uh, he's, he has a reputation for being able to find, to find things where other people don't see anything, he would see a pattern. And um, so he takes his, at that time, girlfriend, who later became his wife, and say, look at the stars, the stars form a very random kind of a pattern. Tell me some object. And she said, umbrella. And he said, well, if you look at these stars, they form an umbrella. And, uh, well, that's a theorem <laughs> in, in the sense that if you have enough, if you have s s some sort of substantial structure, some, if you have a, a, a significant part of a substantial structure inside that part, you'll find many things. There will be patterns that you'll find. And the, uh, um, the more uh, a concrete example of that, um, which re relates also, is, is known as, as Samaradi's theorem, Samaradi also being a, an Abel laureate. Um, um, you, instead of looking at, the, at, at something three-dimensional or two-dimensional, just on the line, just if you look on, on the line and you pick an arbitrary set, but all you can say about that set is that, that if, you look at a, um, if you look at a sufficiently big interval, um, uh, and I'm looking at, 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 at integers, it's the simplest formulation, looking at integers, if I look at a big enough interval, 1% of, uh, of, of the numbers there will belong to this set. I, I've chosen a set, very random looking set, uh, no rules about it, except the following thing, that in a big enough interval, 1%, now it doesn't really have to be 1%, it could be a, a millionth of 1% also. The result will be true. What is the result? I mean, for, the idea is that certain patterns have to be there. Because even, even within random situations, certain patterns have to occur. And the, um, um, and the in, in case of uh, Samaradi's theorem, the pattern, this was a conjecture of Erdish and Turan about a hundred years ago, that, that, uh, that what you'll find are, are arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. Even three, even a three-term arithmetic progression, you'll find you'll find th three numbers in there in that set which are form an arithmetic progression, the middle one being the average of the other two, and so on. I mean, can you can do that for four. That for three, it turned out not to be so difficult. For four, it was already much harder, and that was Samaradi's first contribution, and, and eventually he did it for in, in general. And the, uh, the idea which, um, which sort of I introduced into this, into this setup is, is to think of a dynamical system where, where um, um, 
where again you want to uh, you want to study things recurring, things happen again, and in somehow some sort of a closed dynamical system, something some things have to sort of come back either exactly or very close to where they began, because uh, you're confined. And uh, of course, that's not a proof, but that's that's an idea, and that which is which is valid. And you can then study how do dynamical systems, what kind of recurrences do you have in a dynamical system, in a very arbitrary dynamical system. Now you can think of the integers being a set of states. And your dynamical system tells you in, in, one, in one unit of time you move from one number to the next number, then to the next number, next number. So you, now you think of the set, you want to know when do you get back to the set is when, when do you have a recurrence within that set? And it turns out you can show that you have recurrences along arithmetic progressions of time. In other words, there'll be some time where you're going to get back to the original set of positions, and at more or less the same amount of time you'll get back, to get back again and again and again. So the, uh, now wh why are you better off thinking about dynamical systems? Because it turns out that you can, you can f for a very general kind of dynamical system, I'm not going to go into the details what you need, but in some general kind of confined dynamical system, you can, give it, you can find a structure to it. There'll be a certain amount of periodicity, there'll be a certain amount of randomness, and if you can put these together, then you can show just by step by step that, the, uh, th that it has this, these recurrence properties. So, the, um, so this is a basic idea looking at, looking at dynamic, what happens in a dynamical system, and even though it's a much more complicated object than just the integers, uh, but you can say more about it, and you have this idea of a structure. This turns out to be an example of, of ha just having good luck or uh, serendipity, because it turned out that the structure that these dy general dynamical systems have is a kind of structure that was discovered, was noticed in, in, in very specific kinds of dynamical systems, something called a distal system, where any, any two starting points even though you can get close together, but you never get closer, if they're distinct points, you never get closer to than a certain distance. You don't get arbitrarily close, no matter how, how long you go along these, along these orbits. That's called the distal system. And it turns out one can find the structure. What is a distal system made up of? It's made up of, of rotations and rotations upon rotations and so on. At any rate, this kind of structure turns out to appear in arbitrary dynamical systems. <coughs> And from that you can prove, one gets a dynamical proof of, of the Samaradi theorem and other theorems that go with it. Anyway, that's to give you an idea of what, what I've been working on. And thank you very much for listening. That's, uh, my wife doesn't always listen to me, so <laughs> having an audience that does is a pleasure. <laughs>